through samadhi uh, is usually a direct reflection of what we've been doing with our mind the rest of the day. Um, what we've been doing with our mind the last few weeks, last few months, last few years. Uh, it's all a pretty good indication. Uh, so if we sit down to meditation practice and the mind is scattered and distracted and hazy and filled with desire and irritation and thinking about useless things, well, that's probably because that's what we've been doing with our mind lately. So it's not like you sit down to meditate and like your mind just instantly goes crazy. Actually, it's that your mind has been crazy all day long. It's just that when you sit down to meditate, you start to see that. Uh, and because you, when you sit down to meditate, because you now theoretically want your mind to be peaceful and stable, then the fact that it's not peaceful and stable becomes uh, very evident, comes very sharply into focus. Um, and this is usually the point where we get frustrated and we start saying, oh, meditation is so hard, Buddhism is so hard, um, samadhi is too hard, I'll never get a jhana, I'll never get enlightened. Um, and these are all possibly true statements. Well, the first Buddhism and meditation being hard are true statements anyway. You might still get jhana, and you might still attain enlightenment. In fact, I hope you do. Um, but that uh, what this is pointing to, though, is that if our meditation practice seems like this terrible uphill struggle. The problem is probably not with our meditation practice. It's probably with what we're doing with the rest of our time. Um, so it's very important to keep in mind uh, that mental activity is going on continuously. 24-7. Uh, all the time we're making choices with our mind. We're doing things with our mind. Uh, so those choices are all shaping the direction of our mind. They're all shaping the habits and patterns of the mind. Now, during meditation practice, of course, we continue making choices with our mind, but uh, again, in theory, we're trying to choose to have a mind which is entirely wholesome, uh, a mind which is filled with uh, goodness, gentleness, uh, which is filled with uh, kindness, uh, equanimity, contentment, uh, a mind which is stable, and unified, and clearly knowing, and a mind which is uh, non-attached, which is not clinging to anything that comes and goes. Uh, so those are choices, of course, uh, and those are good choices. Um, but if we're spending most of our time choosing distractibility and irritability and, and craving and annoyance and spaciness and haziness and daydreaming and delusion and time wasting and frivolous thinking, if that's what we're spending most of our time doing with our minds, then that's going to be the habit and tendency of the mind. Uh, so, again, Buddhism is not about becoming a meditation expert. Uh, it's about becoming enlightened. Uh, it's, it's not about learning how to change your mind temporarily for short periods of time. Uh, it's about learning how to completely, totally, permanently transform your mind. Uh, so that means that we need to take into consideration what we're doing every single moment. Uh, so, during meditation practice, we're supposed to be vigilantly watching over our mind, vigilantly watching what we're doing with our mind, and persistently cutting off unwholesome thought patterns the moment they appear, um, and developing wholesome thought patterns. Uh, so a very simple description of meditation practice, but one that's universally true. So then that's what we should be doing with the rest of our time as well. Uh, so during meditation practice, you're sitting here and you start thinking about that TV show you started watching last night. I'm making up a story, I don't watch TV. <laughs> um, who here watches TV? Be honest. This includes watching shows on Netflix, YouTube, uh, movies, videos, um, <coughs> any kind of visual entertainment whatsoever. Anybody here who actually doesn't at all watch such things? Wow. You 
have your hand up for both no, hands. Sorry, no. Okay. <laughs> really? Nothing at all? Great, great. Okay. I'll tell you about some monasteries a bit later on. <laughs> I don't know why you're not living in one already, to be perfectly honest. No. Yeah, so then you're sitting here and you're trying to meditate and you start thinking about, oh, well, then that character said to that other character and then they went off and did this and I wonder what's happening next. And, and what do you think you've been doing all day long? You've been thinking about this show uh, or this movie. So the pattern is still there. The habit is still there. So during meditation practice, we see this thought arise and we're like, oh, frivolous thought. I should not be participating. Let's stop. And you try to stop. And maybe you succeed and you go back to your meditation practice. And then a few seconds later, the thoughts appear again. And you're just like, yes. And then they said, and then they, <laughs> wait, no, frivolous. Cut it off. Come back to the meditation. And, and this can go on and on. And you can spend your entire meditation period in this way. Uh, so, just as during the meditation period, where we're vigil vigilantly watching the mind, uh, vigilantly watching the mind, and persistently cutting off frivolous thought patterns the moment we notice them, well, that's also what we should be doing all day long. Uh, so, all day long, when you're sitting on the subway, when you're walking down the streets, when you're uh, in the toilet, when you're at your job, when, whatever you're doing, when you see those frivolous thoughts arise, cut them off immediately. Don't give them even a moment's time. Uh, when you see those, those useless thoughts appear, don't give them any time at all. Cut them off immediately. Don't waste your time with these things. Uh, or, uh, again, we're sitting here in meditation and, and we start to be filled with a craving for something. Uh, again, fill in the blank. Mm, craving for... What do people crave? I don't know. What do you food. crave? Food. Okay, that's always a safe one. Most people have some kind of food-related cravings. Uh, so craving for particular kinds of food appears in your mind. Uh, and again, normally we play along for a few seconds before we remember, oh yes, I'm trying to meditate. I shouldn't be thinking about food. And, and we try to drop it and come back to contentment. Uh, again, why is that appearing in the mind? Uh, it's because we've been nurturing that craving with the rest of our time. Uh, we've been thinking about how much we like that kind of food, or how much we, we wish we had it, or maybe planning on, on going out to a, a restaurant the next day, or maybe right after the meditation class, as the case may be. Uh, so we're constantly nurturing and feeding that craving, which is why it has so much power and predominance in the mind. Uh, so again, cultivating that mind of contentment and clarity all day long, always bringing the mind to contentment. Whenever we notice any kind of, of desire or aversion arising in the mind, instantly cut it off. Don't give it even a moment in your mind. Uh, these things are, are poisonous, they're harmful, they're destructive. If we allow them to persist even for a fraction of a moment, they damage our mind. They weaken the wholesome qualities that lead towards true happiness and peace. Uh, they foster anxiety and agitation and disturbance and discontent. Uh, they are immediately uncomfortable. Uh, you don't even have to wait to see the harmful effects of these, of these thought patterns, of these emotional patterns, of these uh, impulses and desires and irritations in the mind. Uh, just look at them the moment they appear and you can see that they're already uncomfortable. They're already unpleasant. Uh, and they also create the conditions for ever-deepening agitation, disturbance, and discomfort. Uh, so there's no sense in giving even a moment's space to these things. Uh, so frivolous thoughts, uh, craving, mm, irritation, mm, spaciness. Uh, so maybe it's just a tendency to want to, to let your mind go dull and hazy. Uh, and there's a certain sweetness to it. That that kind of like foggy haze of not quite being awake. There is a certain sweetness to it. Uh, but it's very destructive because that is the seed of ignorance. That's what prevents us from clearly understanding what's going on moment by moment. Uh, and when we don't clearly understand what's going on in our mind, then our subconscious habits and patterns will dominate. And our 
our subconscious habits and patterns are not wholesome, for the most part. Some of them are. Some of, them are. Some of what we've planted in our subconscious is actually quite good, especially if you've been practicing Buddhism for a few lifetimes. In your subconscious mind, you <coughs> have some, some very wholesome habits. And, um, but also, there's a whole lot of unwholesome habits, which is why we're not enlightened yet. If our subconscious mind was entirely 100% wholesome, then by definition we would be a Buddha. Since we're not, anybody in here a Buddha? I ask this from time to time, just out of the blind hope that things have improved since last time. Any Buddhas in the room? No? Okay, me neither. Uh, so, once again, we're working on developing a completely wholesome mind, but we're not there yet. So that means that if we let our subconscious habits gain control, which is what we do all the time. If we let our subconscious habits gain control, then we're just going to keep manifesting unenlightened behavior. Uh, and we're going to keep manifesting mm, agitation, anxiety, mm, irritation, discomfort, displeasure, uh, the whole <coughs> host of mm, irritating mind states that we keep saying we don't want. And even though we say we don't want them, we keep nurturing the conditions that bring them into being. Uh, so there was a famous monk from roughly 500 AD, and I can't remember his name right now, uh, but he said, uh, actually you might know, it was either Nagarjuna, Atisha, or uh, anyway, uh, what he said was, uh, we hate suffering, but we love its causes. Do you know this quote? No? Okay. I'll find out later who said this. We hate suffering, but we love its causes. So what this monk was pointing to was, was the simple fact that uh, on the one hand, we're constantly creating the causes for our own misery, but on the other hand, we're lamenting all of the misery that we experience. Uh, this is actually summed up really simply in the introduction to an Ajahn Brahm book. So the title of the Ajahn Brahm book is Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung? And this title comes from uh, a talk he gave where it was centered around the metaphor of uh, one day a truck comes and dumps a bunch of dung on your driveway. And you're like, who ordered this truckload of dung? Well, guess who ordered it? You did. So that's actually what we're constantly doing. We're constantly filling our mind with feces and then wondering, like, who put all this feces in my head? Guess what? You did. You're the one who put all that crap in your head. You're the one who put all those burning, painful, poisonous tendencies in your heart. You did it. Nobody else's fault. Your fault. Uh, which is incredibly empowering. So it's recognizing that we are the ones who poisoned our own minds means that we're the ones who can cure it. We are the ones who continually create the causes of our own misery and torment, which means we're the ones who can change that. Uh, and it's done in this moment-by-moment -moment decision. So every single moment, whether it's a period of meditation or not, every single moment, vigilantly watch your mind. Every single moment, cultivate sharp, clear, intense self-awareness clearly feeling body and mind in every moment, never letting the mind wander from the present moment, always keeping it firmly rooted in awareness of body and mind, and always watching, watching what we're doing with our mind, uh, and trying to always do what's wholesome. Uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean keeping a silent mind. Uh, there's a place, uh, a time and place for a silent mind, uh, but there's also a time and place for thinking using thought patterns. Uh, and so when it's a time for thinking, we just make sure that we're thinking things that are useful, that are relevant. And we make sure that our thinking is always wholesome, that it's always in line with the principles of wisdom and compassion, uh, that we're always using mental activity in a way that nurtures wholesome mind states and reduces unwholesome mind states. So for example, sitting there and mm, Reflecting for five minutes on how incredibly delicious pizza is, is not a wholesome thought pattern because it nurtures craving, it nurtures attachment, 
and it nurtures the delusion that happiness can be found through sensual experiences. Uh, so that would be an example of something which, uh, for an ordinary non-Buddhist worldling, harmless activity. Who doesn't sit around and dream about pizza once in a while? Totally normal. But when you start getting into Buddhist practice, you realize that that activity of sitting around reflecting on the joys of eating pizza is making us less happy, not more happy. It's making us less wise, not more wise. Uh, and it nurtures all of the unwholesome tendencies of mind, which lead to mm, destructive <coughs> conduct, uh, destructive activities of body and speech. Uh, so, again, constantly watch the mind. Uh, watch whenever we start to drift into mm, obsession. Uh, watch whenever we start to latch on to an experience we're having with that mind of, uh, I love this. This can't stop. This has to continue. This is too good to stop. This is too good to change. It has to continue. Notice when we cultivate that mind. Uh, and stop. Immediately. Uh, instead, develop contentment. Contentment whether things change or not. Contentment whether things stay the same or not. Uh, recognizing that no matter what happens, uh, we always have this capability, this ability to restabilize the mind, this ability to drop the desire and aversion and bring the mind back to a place of peace and contentment. Uh, recognizing that contentment is a decision that we make. Uh, even when we experience uh, pain, so when we experience pain, then we recognize it's just this. There's nothing wrong. It's just a sensation. It's just a sensation that comes and goes. Uh, so there's no need to become disturbed. There's no need to generate disturbance in the mind. Instead, we remain aware of the experience without trying to push it away without trying to obscure it, uh, and keep the mind peaceful, peacefully aware of the shifting, changing sensations of body and mind. Uh, so if we keep working on our mind in this way, uh, so all day long we're avoiding frivolous thoughts, uh, cutting them off the moment they appear, all day long we're, sh uh, we're maintaining sharp, clear <coughs> self-awareness, so sharp, clear mindfulness of body and mind. All day long we're cutting off desire and aversion. All day long we're cultivating contentment and equanimity. Uh, then when we come to do a meditation practice, when we sit down for a period of, of sitting meditation, then you'll notice it doesn't take much effort. And you can pretty much just sit down, position the body upright, relax, and you'll notice the mind already drops into samadhi. You don't have to go through this whole effort of like trying to force the mind to focus, and then it keeps going away and thinking about uh, TV and video games and music and uh, pizza and whatever else it is your mind thinks about. I know these are very trite examples. Maybe you have really lofty things. Maybe you think about Mozart and art galleries or whatever, but that's all the same. That's all the same feces. So whatever kind of feces your mind goes off towards, <coughs> Uh, and then we have to struggle to pull it back. It's like, no, I'm trying to meditate. And then, bam, it's off again. No, trying to meditate. Well, if on the other hand, you've been cultivating wholesome qualities all day long, if you've constantly been working to maintain a stable, wholesome, peaceful, contented mind, then when you sit down to meditation practice, you'll notice your mind is already pretty stable. It's already pretty peaceful. There's not a whole lot of work that needs to be done. For the most part, you can just relax, um, center your attention, and let the body and mind be still. Uh, and then it's just this practice of keeping body and mind still and bright, and just letting that brightness grow, letting that brightness shine ever brighter and brighter. It's a very simple practice. Uh, but the strength of it depends on what we've been doing with the rest of our time. So this is something which runs all throughout the Buddha's discourses. 
So there's this persistent misunderstanding uh, in the Western world. Now, this persistent misunderstanding that Buddhism is all about meditation practice. I really have no idea where people get this from, because if you read a few suttas, it becomes incredibly clear that meditation represents only a tiny fraction of what the Buddha taught. Uh, the majority of what the Buddha spoke about was things which apply in everyday life. Uh, he spoke about generosity. Uh, in fact, he spoke a tremendous amount about how incredibly important it is to give to others, to share with others, um, to be open-hearted towards others, um, to, be, you know, to be kind, to be thoughtful, to be considerate. Uh, he spoke a tremendous amount about morality. Uh, and he summed up morality mm, mm, everywhere from very short summaries to fairly long, detailed lists of examples. The short summary is very simple. Uh, don't harm anyone. Try to help everyone. Really simple. Don't harm. Try to hurt. No, wait. Don't harm. Try to help. There we go. That was almost bad. <laughs> don't harm. Try to help. Really simple principles. Even five-year-olds know this. They might not do it, but they know it. It's something everybody knows. Uh, we like to find excuses to do other things, but we know. And then he goes into a lot more details. Uh, when the time arises, he speaks about five precepts. Uh, so not killing, not stealing, uh, not engaging in harmful sexual behavior, um, not telling lies, not using intoxicants. He goes into further descriptions on right speech, so how to speak in ways that are not harmful, um, how to speak in ways that are beneficial. He goes into a lot of detail on action and activity, ways of interacting with the world that are harmless and beneficial. Um, but it's all based on this basic principle. Don't harm, try to help. Really simple principle. So he, said, he spends a tremendous amount of time talking about morality. Uh, so clearly this is something that he considered extremely important. Uh, and even when the Buddha talks about uh, mindfulness and concentration, uh, a lot of the time he's talking about uh, applying it in ordinary situations. He doesn't specifically say, only practice mindfulness while sitting down. He doesn't say, only practice concentration while sitting down. Uh, he doesn't say, only practice equanimity while sitting down. He doesn't say, only practice loving kindness while sitting down. Like, this, this is all, uh, it's all nonsense. It's, uh, it has nothing to do with what the Buddha was talking about. The Buddha said that we should develop loving kindness with body, speech, and mind, in public and in private, at all times, no matter what situation we're in. Uh, he said we should be developing and maintaining constant, unremitting mindfulness and concentration. Uh, that we should be applying equanimity to every situation that we meet. That we should always be seeking to eliminate desire and aversion the moment they appear. Uh, we should always be vigilantly uh, guarding and controlling our own mind. Uh, so, he did talk about meditation practice. Uh, and the main way he spoke about it, in fact, was, was simply in terms of the four jhanas. Uh, talking about the importance of Mm, unifying the mind, uh, of allowing the mind to be steady, uh, completely collected together. Uh, but even in, in talking about insight or wisdom, uh, for the most part he's talking about things which you can do all the time. Uh, again, the perception of impermanence, uh, which is the form of insight meditation that I teach the most often. The perception of impermanence is not something which can only be done during meditation practice. Uh, of course, it has its deepest, most profound effects uh, when the mind is well concentrated in sitting meditation. Uh, but actually, all throughout your day, look for the impermanent, insubstantial, constantly changing nature of experience. It's always here. It's always here. Nothing is ever permanent. Ever. It's amazing how much time we spend living in our little dream of permanent, substantial objects. Total delusion, fabrication of our own cr 
crazy mind. Nothing whatsoever to do with reality. But it's where we spend most of our time. In this weird little dream that we've built up of permanent objects. Just pay attention to your experience. Look for impermanence, and you see it staring right back at you every single moment of your day. Every single waking moment is right in front of you. And uh, again, if we develop that perception all day long, then a few things shift dramatically. Uh, one thing that shifts dramatically is we stop getting so obsessed with things. Uh, it's easier to maintain equanimity. Uh, when you see that there's nothing that can be held on to, then you stop trying to hold on to things. So developing a perception of impermanence in everyday life makes a tremendous difference towards helping us uh, to let go of harmful mind states and to cultivate and maintain equanimity. And again, then when we go and do meditation practice, uh, if we try to practice the meditation on impermanence, we'll find it's much easier. Once again, because we've already been practicing it all day long something that we've already been developing all day long. Similarly, if you're having a really hard time doing loving-kindness meditation, well, try being kind to people in real life. Like, smile at people. Give them little gifts. Say nice things to them. Uh, think gentle thoughts. Speak gentle words. Uh, perform acts gently, considerately. Uh, and then when you go and do loving-kindness meditation, you might find it's a little bit easier, or a lot easier. You might find it's much more powerful, goes more deeply into the mind, has a stronger impact on the mind. So, this is a major emphasis of practice in monastic life. Now, a major emphasis of practice in monastic life is that we're not just doing <laughs> X number of minutes of meditation. The other day somebody asked me, how many hours do you meditate every day? Well, the answer is actually completely irrelevant. Uh, there's one person I know who, he claims he meditates six hours a day. And I don't know what he's doing with those six hours, because he acts like somebody who just discovered Buddhism yesterday. And supposedly he's been doing six hours of meditation a day for years and years and years. Uh, but you talk to him and his mind is scattered and all over the place and he's very grumpy and irritable and, and it's like, well, what have you been doing with your time? Like, are you actually meditating? Uh, or are you just facing out? Uh, are you actually meditating or are you just perpetuating all of the unwholesome mental activities that you do with the other 18 hours of your day? Uh, so, the real correct answer, when asked how many hours do you meditate every day, the only correct answer is 24. There's no other correct answer. Some of that will be done while sitting, some will be done while standing, some while walking, some while lying down, some while talking, some while working. some while engaged in all manner of activities. But our practice is to constantly train the mind, constantly watch the mind, constantly guard the mind, constantly point the mind towards awakening. And this is how we make forward progress. Uh, so one simple way of looking at practice is, we're here, enlightenment is over there, point ourselves towards enlightenment, and keep moving forward. That's it. But realistically, what we often do is we move forward for half an hour, and then we move backward for 23 and a half hours, and then we move forward for half an hour, and we move backwards for 23 and a half hours. This is really bad math, isn't it? <coughs> really bad. This is not forward progress. Uh, it's possible to backslide extremely quickly if we're not careful. So instead, uh, we try to keep moving forward. We try to keep improving and developing our wholesome habits. We try to keep weakening and discarding our unwholesome habits. We try to keep developing an ever deeper, clearer self-awareness. Uh, and we try to keep cultivating the willingness to let go of absolutely anything which is obstructive to awakening. No matter how much we cherish it, no matter how much we like it, no matter how much we identify as it, 
Uh, we keep cultivating the willingness to let go of absolutely anything that stands between us and Buddhahood. I think that's all I have to say for a moment. Uh, so, at this time, if there's any questions or anything that you wish to discuss, now's the opportunity. Yeah, go ahead. When you um, experience um, some discomfort or like some numbingness with your feet, how, how do you like recenter your Well, first thing to do, first off actually I should say that there's two basic strategies that you can use in that situation. Uh, and there's other options, but these are the two first recommended ones. Uh, one option is to mm, focus even more intently and strongly on your meditation object on your meditation technique, whatever it is. Uh, because if 100% of your attention is on your meditation method, then you simply won't have the space in your mind to be bothered by pain, to be irritated by physical sensation. You just won't have the bandwidth for it. Uh, if your mind is 100% devoted to the meditation technique, then you have 0% for everything else. So you actually don't feel pain. When your samadhi, when your uh, concentration is completely developed, completely steady, you don't feel pain. It's impossible. So from first jhana onwards, no pain. None at all. Can't happen. Impossible. So that's one approach. Uh, if the pain or discomfort is so intense that you feel like you can't concentrate anymore, like it's really disrupting your concentration, then you can instead make the pain your meditation object. <coughs> so focus all your attention on feeling the sensation as intensely and clearly as possible. Uh, with an attitude of genuine interest and curiosity, uh, and with the willingness to stay with it for eternity. So for this to work, you have to approach it with the attitude even if this pain remains for eternity, that's okay. I'll stay right here with it. Uh, and the attitude of, I really want to know what's going on here. I really want to understand. Uh, and then as you do that, then you'll start to unfold the layers of experience. And you'll discover that uh, on the bottom of it, there's the physical substrate, the physical layer, which is purely sensation. It's not pain. It's just pure information. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, so information in and of itself is not painful or pleasant. It's just information. That's all it is. Physical sensation is just information. And you'll see on top of that, there are layers of mental activity, which are mostly run by force of habit, so there are things which, when we don't pay attention to them, we'll just go by whatever our habit is. Uh, and those mental activities are what is generating the, the experience of pain. So on the bottom layer, there's just pure, raw information, pure sensation. Then on top of that, there's perceiving the sensation as something in particular which we don't like. Actually, first there's perceiving it as something we don't like. Then there's perceiving it as something specific that we don't like. And usually on top of that, there's a whole layer of uh, mental and emotional reactions. Uh, and then maybe on top of that, there might be some conscious thinking of, I hate this, I want this to stop, etc. So you'll start to piece apart these layers. And what you'll discover is that at each layer, you have a choice. A choice whether or not to participate in that activity. And you'll notice that when you choose to disengage from the activity, when you choose to stop participating, then it immediately stops being a problem. So if you stay with this long enough, then you'll pierce all the way down to the bottom, and it will stop hurting. The sensation will still continue in whatever form it continues in, but it won't be painful anymore. It won't be uncomfortable anymore. It will just be sensation. In fact, sometimes it starts to feel really good. Sometimes it doesn't, but either way, 
it isn't a problem anymore. So the first method is the method of, of samadhi, which is pure concentration. The second one is the method of, of wisdom, of panya or vipassana, the method of, of clearly seeing the experience in order to understand it and to start breaking off the mm, unwholesome mental habits that are generating the painful experience. Um, so, depending on what is easier for you, mm, you use what's relevant. You pick one or the other and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be courageous. The courage to face your own sensations. It takes real courage to practice Buddhism. But if you have that courage, then you can make incredible progress in short amounts of time. That willingness to just keep pushing forward, no matter what you face. Because all you're facing is yourself. Which is the most terrifying thing in the entire world. But also the most wonderful. You just keep pushing forward no matter what appears. Uh, and you can make progress extremely quickly. So there's a, a quote which appears a few times in the suttas. Uh, the Buddha said it before he was the Buddha. So the night when he attained enlightenment, he said this before he started his final period of meditation that night. Uh, and also a number of places in the suttas he recommends taking on the same attitude. Uh, so paraphrased, what he says is, uh, even if all the blood and flesh in my bones, uh, all the blood and flesh in my body dries up and the only bones and skin remain, still I will not move from this place uh, until I've, I've reached my mind's ideal. Uh, so it's this, this firm aspiration like, even if it feels like you're dying, you're just going to keep sitting like a rock. Keep training the mind. Because actually you are dying. You've been dying from the moment you were born. So, it's true. If you feel like you're dying, it's true. You are. So, whatever sensation arises, maybe it feels like your legs are breaking. Uh, they're not, by the way. You're just sitting still. No problem. Uh, or maybe it feels like, like your back is exploding. Well, it's not. Or maybe it is, but who cares? Because we're going to keep practicing and training our mind. So it's developing that complete determination, uh, that courageous resolution that we're just going to keep pressing forward no matter what. Uh, and if you do this, then the way you view your body starts to change <coughs> dramatically. Uh, we've spent our whole lives being the slaves of our bodies, being controlled and dictated by our bodies. Our body telling us how to feel. Our body telling us whether to be happy or sad. Uh, but as you develop this meditation practice, then that power structure starts to turn around. And you start to realize that your happiness is not determined by your body. So you try to continue maintaining a wholesome mind right up until the moment you fall asleep and try to establish your practice again as soon as you can once you wake up. And you'll start to become more aware. Uh, so as your mind starts to drift off to sleep, then you'll notice your consciousness becoming more fragmented <coughs> until eventually you fall asleep. Um, and then when you wake up, uh, normally what happens when most people wake up is that they're in this kind of zombie-like haze where they're running uh, kind of on this muddled autopilot for a period of time, anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. Um, sometimes up until the first cup of coffee or tea and beyond. Uh, so with 
your practice, the more you develop the habit of a sharp, clear, alert, knowing mind, uh, peaceful, bright, intensely alert mind, the more you develop that habit throughout your day, uh, then you'll notice that when you wake up in the morning, that habit becomes established more quickly and easily. So that if before you were in this kind of zombie haze for 30 minutes, well, after practicing for a while, a few months maybe, maybe that cuts down to 15 minutes. Over time, maybe it cuts down to 15 seconds. Uh, and you can eventually get to a point where you wake up and you immediately know, oh, I'm awake now. <coughs> And there might be an impulse that appears in the mind, but we immediately know that's an unwholesome impulse, I am not going to participate. So you wake up and you instantly go into mindfulness, concentration, and equanimity. Uh, you can get to that point with practice, with time, with diligence. Um, and also as time goes by, then you might notice that mm, what happens between falling asleep and waking up starts to change. So that tends to be a much more muddled, confused period of time. Um, but still, during that time, we make choices. So things start to change. Um, you'll start to notice, you might start to notice that in your dreams, your behavior changes. You start to act like a decent person during your dreams. You might find that you start, you might even find yourself practicing meditation during your dreams. Uh, or your dreams might have a more distinctly Buddhist character to them. Or you might stop dreaming entirely. Uh, this sometimes happens uh, as people develop their practices. And sometimes, eventually, they stop dreaming entirely. And that's okay. It's not a problem. It's only a problem if we crave dreaming. Uh, but craving dreaming is just the same as craving delusion. It doesn't do us any good. So cultivating a, that bright, intense, alert awareness all day long, trying to keep it right up until the point where you fall asleep, and then resume right when you wake up. Okay? Anything else? So aversion is also an unwholesome mind state. So the moment you see aversive thoughts arising, then you cut those off as well. So thinking, I really hate food, is just as bad as thinking, I really love food. Both attitudes of mind are destructive. Both attitudes of mind cultivate uh, an experience of discomfort. Um, both tendencies of mind lead us away from the path. So that's not useful either. So you just keep vigilant watch over the mind and recognize those also uh, are not the right path. Um, so there are practices that can be done if somebody has a strong attachment to food. There are practices that can be done to weaken that obsession, to weaken that craving. But the practice is never to cultivate aversion. That's not the way. That only makes the problem worse. It just makes it into a, a different kind of problem. But it doesn't remove the underlying problem. Um, it's still a form of obsessiveness. Uh, so what we're seeking to cultivate is not aversion. What we're seeking to cultivate is disenchantment. So disenchantment is um, a wholesome, joyful, serene, peaceful state of mind. Whereas aversion is not peaceful, it's not happy, it's not wholesome. So it's not where we're trying to develop. But rather we just see, in this case, we just see food as 
what ifs and something that helps keep us healthy. Uh, so we don't want to have an obsession with it, uh, but we also don't want to have aversion towards it. Both of those are just ways that we disturb our mind. two completely different things. There's the physical sensation of hunger, which is just your body saying, I need nourishment. That's it. So that doesn't go away. As long as you have a body, the body will continue to send signals saying, I need, I need food, I'm hungry. So that's not a problem. Uh, even a Buddha has the sensation of hunger. He's just not bothered by it. He's fully aware of it. Uh, so, craving is a mental activity of, I really want this, I want this, I need this. It's a mental activity. That's what we're seeking to cut off. So the physical sensation, that's actually fine. So again, just as with, with pain, so you watch the physical sensation and you see it's just this much. And we try not to add anything extra to it. We don't add on mental craving, and we also don't add on aversion. We just recognize, oh, this is a sensation of hunger. It means that my body is running low on nutrition. No problem. I should probably eat something at some point. But we don't then go into thinking like, oh, I really hate having a body. I really hate needing to eat. I really hate hunger. This is so annoying. Well, that's not wholesome. That's just stirring up more discomfort in the mind. But we also don't go into like, ooh, yes, yes, I need to go out for pizza after work, yes. Like, well, that's not wholesome either. And instead you just recognize, oh, this is the sensation of hunger. It means the body needs to eat. So at some point I'm going to make sure to eat. That's it. End of story. It doesn't need to be any more complicated. Uh, we make things more complicated than they have to be. Uh, and mostly the reason we make things more complicated than they have to be is because we try to justify our defilements. Uh, we have the defilements that we like, our, our pet defilements, um, and we like to feed them and nourish them and play with them. Um, and we desperately resist anything which threatens our defilements, our little pet defilements. But with Buddhist practice, we're becoming increasingly aware that our little pet defilements are horrible, vicious demons that are destroying our lives, uh, and it's time to get rid of them. So no, aversion is not the answer. Disenchantment is not aversion. And the sensation of hunger is perfectly fine. It's just part of having a body. Anything else we still have a few minutes? talking about food, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough, um, even topic. So, um, I find practicing Buddhism has kept me a little, um, helped me become more mindful and to really kind of be in a joyful moment, uh, which sometimes food is part of that. I see food and it sparks joy. It's walking down the street to come here and I smell like um, grass and trees. Um, I do understand that to have your maybe emotions so triggered might be a different type of defilement. Um, <coughs> is it a bad thing? Well, the thing we're taking is to always start with full awareness of the experience. Uh, so noticing these sensations are producing an emotional reaction of happiness. Like, okay, that's what's going on. So you 
start with that, that wisdom of clearly knowing what's going on. Uh, and seeing the causal connection helps quite a bit. Uh, so you understand why is this experience appearing. Uh, and bring in the perception of impermanence. Recognize that this sensation is impermanent, <coughs> which means that the mm, mental, emotional pleasure arising based on this experience is conditional and therefore unreliable. It's still here, and that's okay. Uh, so Buddhist practice is not about trying to prevent you from ever being happy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, it's about learning how to be happy all the time. Uh, so we recognize this experience is temporary, uh, it's conditional, the happiness arising based on this sensation is conditional, therefore it's unreliable. Therefore, when it changes, I will not be disturbed. So we make that resolution. When it changes, I will not be disturbed. I will not be bothered. I will continue to be happy and peaceful, even as the situation changes. Uh, because then you walk down the next block, and instead of the lovely smell of trees, instead you smell a dumpster. Uh, and it's, mm, then what does the mind do? Maybe something a little bit less happy. But still, we make that same practice of like, I will not be disturbed by this experience. I will not be swept up in it. Um, yeah, so it's not about trying to cut off everything that bring, brings pleasure into our lives. Uh, that's a form of, of self-torment, which the Buddha did not recommend. He did not, did not recommend self-torment. Um, but rather, again, cultivating disenchantment, non-attachment clearly seeing the experience uh, and recognizing that if we try to hold on to it, then we will inevitably suffer. Uh, but if we're willing to allow things to change, which they will anyway, then we will not suffer. Does that clear that up? Yes. Um, although I think we've been talking about the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So where does that sense of contentment and um, so it's the decision to be content. That's really what it boils down to. It's being completely okay with absolutely any situation that arises. So making that determination, no matter what happens, I will not be disturbed. Uh, and so then we have that on... Mm, the surface of the mind as a conscious intent, a conscious resolution, I will not be disturbed no matter what happens. And that carries a small amount of power, very small, but some. Then as we constantly strengthen and increase our mindfulness and concentration, uh, then more and more of the subconscious mind becomes accessible. Uh, and the power of that resolution grows and grows. So the power of that resolution depends upon the strength of our mindfulness and concentration. It also depends to some degree on the strength of our wisdom, uh, in the sense that we usually have, uh, again, certain reserves in our mind, like everything's impermanent except these things over here, those are definitely permanent. Everything is impersonal except these things, these are definitely me. Uh, so we also need to keep reminding ourselves, absolutely everything is impermanent. Absolutely everything is impersonal. There must be the willingness to let go of absolutely everything uh, in order to be truly happy. Um, and that can be a little daunting at first, so we just take it one step at a time. Uh, whatever is in front of me right now, whatever experience is currently going on, I will allow it to change uh, without either gleefully seeking its end, that would be aversion, uh, and without desperately trying to keep it going, that would be clean. So, yeah, again, mindfulness, wonderful. Uh, then we introduce the perception of impermanence, we cultivate non-attachment, uh, we cultivate contentment. We form that determination uh, that no matter what happens, we will not be swayed by it. We will not be disturbed by it.
think we'll end at this point. Uh, so thank you all for coming, for practicing together, and for your attention, and for your questions.